That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Innocence, the sophomore film directed by Eskel Vogt, which premiered at the 2021 Cannes Film Festival in Un Certain Regard. Uh, it is being released theatrically stateside, courtesy of IFC Midnight, on May 13th, 2022. Have you seen this director's first film? Uh, yes, it was called Blind in 2014, starring Ellen Dorrit Peterson, who is the mother in this film. Uh, oh. He is more notable, though, as the screenwriter of Joaquin Trier, um, who I believe he's written all of Joaquin Trier's films to date, including uh, last year's The Worst Person in the World, which was nominated for an Oscar for Best Screenplay. Oh. Well, this film... Oh. And it's not to be confused with the classic Deborah Carr adaptation of The Turn of the Screw, scripted by Truman Capote. Okay. Uh, this film made me uncomfortable. <laughs> it yes, really did. Same. Uh, we can get into that. But the basic story is there's this family in Norway, modern time, mom, dad, and two daughters. Mm -hmm. The daughters are like maybe like 11 and 13. You're not good with kids' ages. I'm but, not. But sure, for the purposes. Okay. Of well, how old do you think they are? I think that the younger daughter... Uh, Ida is probably like six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. Really? Yeah, she seems really young to me. Oh, I would think she's like 11. Oh. I'm really bad with kids' ages. Oh, and also that uh, actress, Raquel Lenora Flotman, is the actual daughter of uh, Ellen Dork Peterson. Oh, funny, because I thought they looked very similar. Yeah, we kept comment. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the older daughter suffers from autism. Anna. Anna, like severe. She's unable to speak. She can't really take care of herself. And immediately we see the younger daughter is vile. She's just like the bad seed. She's like hurting her sister to try to get a response out of her. She's like standing on bridges, spitting on cars. She's hurting animals. It's clear she resents her sister, yeah. And they've notably, they've just moved to a new apartment complex. Okay. Huh. There, there's a lot going on. But basically... The younger daughter makes friends with this little brown boy. Ben. And the autistic older sister kind of connects with this other little younger brown girl. Aisha. Aisha is very kind to Anna. Mm -hmm. And they seem to like communicate telepathically, which results in Anna starting to like actually like verbalize words. The little brown boy, what's his name? Ben. Ben and then... Aisha. I, no, the bad girl. Ida. Ben and Ida connect, and they're doing bad hood rat shit together. Like, hurting animals. Like, they, they find, like, what looks like a molehill and try to, like, squash it with a rock. I think it's ants. Or ants. They take a cat and, like, drop it from, like, a very high level. The top of a stairwell down the middle. And which, yeah, breaks the cat's limbs, and they go and, like, crush its skull. That was very disturbing. Yes. Okay. But... We find out that Anna, the autistic daughter, and Ben, they have like like X-Men powers. Like they can communicate telepathically. They can like they can make move. things levitate, move things. Uh, yeah, telekinesis. Mind yeah. control. So it becomes kind of like like bad. Like Anna's like the, the hero and Ben is the villain maybe, yeah. which is the part that made me uncomfortable. But ultimately... Ben ends up hurting several people, like his mom killing a couple people. <laughs> uh, Anna, or Aisha, the little brown girl, ends up dying. And then the two sisters end up killing Ben. The end. I mean, right? I mean, yes. that's it. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I, I, I am a fan of like evil children films. I love Who Could Kill a Child. Village of the Damned, both versions. Uh, there's a 2008 film called Chil The Children that I really liked, a British film. Uh, this is more trying for an art house angle, but I think it fails on several levels. Okay. Oh my God. First of all, I feel weird about, and you know, like making the autistic girl be like this magical creature. Yes. <laughs> I, that kind of made me uncomfortable. Number one, of course, watching the two badass kids hurting animals was uncomfortable. But I think 
Probably the biggest thing was the fact that this Norwegian family, this white family, they're presented like in a more affluent way and living in like nicer accommodations. But then the two brown kids, they both come from single family homes. Like it's just a single mom. They appear to live in the projects. And then... That's the weird thing. The The sense that you get is watching these families is um, they're all living in the same kind of building. But the way that the white family is presented, uh, there, there's just a complete different vibe uh, as to how they're presented yes. compared to the, the, the families of color. Then Aisha, of all the characters, little brown girl, she's the most like sweet girl. Like She's a nice little girl. And she's also an outcast because she seems to have some sort of like hypopigmentation on her face. She's a vitiligo. Maybe, but then it also looks like she has sores on those spots. So clearly like probably other kids would make fun of her. So she's kind of a loner, but she's very kind to Anna and communicates with her telepathically and is assisting her in many ways. So I'm confused why Ben, little brown boy, and then Anna, who both have similar powers, although it's, we're made to understand that Anna's more powerful than Ben, why she's presented as like, like she's going to persist, even though she's attached to her evil ass sister. To me, like, I think they I, should be the villains. I think Ida <laughs> is presented as someone that's uh, on the fence, if you will, because she does recoil at Ben's actions with the cat and, and does kind of come around to see that he is, uh, I don't want to say evil, but is clearly this traumatized child. Like he's, he's clearly being abused physically uh, and mentally, uh, which kind of explains his sociopathic behavior. Uh, I'm not saying it's racist. I'm saying that if someone thinks it's racist, I wouldn't disagree with them, but... I, th I think the optics of it definitely uh, lead itself open to that interpretation. But probably the bigger thought is, like, I don't understand the message, like, good versus evil. I don't understand who's... Who, like, who we're supposed to be rooting for. I don't understand where these powers come and from. And do they dissipate? It, see, it doesn't establish any kind of ground rules because it, it seems to... This seems to be coming from a director who thinks like there's this magical world of children that adults can't see in the way that they communicate and move about the world. But there are uh, real world ramifications to these children's actions. So I feel like it would have made it would behoove the director and screenwriter uh, to have laid out what what are the limitations. Of right, because powers. Ida doesn't appear to have any powers or be able to communicate telepathically. But she she embraces herself at the end and does have powers because she psychically is able to break that cast off of her leg. But then Aisha doesn't seem to have powers, but she can she, communicate telepathically with Anna. So yes, yeah, so I'm very confused what their abilities are, how they're able to hone and, them. And where it really messes up is how Ben moves about. And it, clearly he's afraid of Anna, but he's able to do what's called fetching, is controlling the bodies of others to do his evil bidding. Uh, and that is how Aisha is killed because he takes over her mother and Aisha is stabbed. And then that awkwardness lends itself to their, you know, their altars uh, around the complex for Aisha. And Ida says to her dad, like, you would never do that to me, right? Because her mother killed her. And he's like, oh no, we could possibly never. And it sets up this narrative of like, oh, it's, of course, it's assumed that this, uh, I, I would assume she's African, but this black mother uh, would have, would you know kill her children, but this beautiful white family wouldn't. It just has the, that kind of element that adds that level of discomfort that I think could have been uh, I could I think that could have been avoided. Okay, what did I like? It has an effective like mood. I think the movie looks good. The there are some special effects that I think are they're used sparingly. Maybe because of budget, but I think they look really good. I think, you know, usually I don't like watching kids act, but I think all of these kids did a good job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I. it's just so weird because there are sort of emotional moments, particularly the first time, because we're told that Anna started becoming nonverbal, like very, like when she was like three or four. Mm -hmm. And she appears to be like an adolescent or a teenager. So it's been a long time that her parents have dealt with her in this form. And then one day, with the help of little Aisha, they're in the sandbox, and Anna talks to her mom. And then, of course, the mom is, like, very emotional, brings her back home, and is, like, really pushing her, saying more words. The dad is there, like, don't push her too hard. But then Anna is saying, like, daddy, mommy. That was very emotional, and I thought th those are really good scenes. But then... But I wish I would have rather had them explore it because once Aisha dies, her conduit for being able to do that is gone, and you would kind of leave these parents hanging in the lurch of the sure. child's new developments. Like there, are, because 
you know, as often in the case with the autistic children in narratives, there's this this pressure to make them want to interact with uh, other people in the way that they interact and they, they just can't. And so like it, it, it leads us down again, a different kind of uncomfortable path about the parents and what they want for their child. Then a big, I mean, there is a lot of like this mind control thing that, I mean, there's a lot of it in the film, like Ben controlling characters. Like he gets some man to kill his bully. He like, damn near kills his mom in a really uncomfortable kitchen scene where he, he like does, kill her. does he kill her where he like hits her in the head with a hot pan and then pours hot like water on her and then um he is hurting aisha's mom like we see blood dripping from her forehead at one point well, because, which we think is in her mind i don't know yes because the mothers also have the, again like things aren't it's just like they drop he drops these little kernels of ideas like wouldn't it be cool if the mothers also had this kind of psychic can, it almost gave me like a Firestarter vibe, which we're going to watch today with Zac Efron. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, Joaquin Trier and Esco Vogt also did a film called Thelma, a couple, 2017, uh, about a lesbian teenager uh, that uh, her sexual awakening leads to kind of this like Carrie, Stephen King's Carrie kind of vibe. So they've dealt with this, he's dealt sure. with this kind of energy before. <laughs> There's a scene where... Um, Ida pushes Ben off of a bridge, hoping that he'll land like in oncoming traffic, but he lands in like um, the landscaping so he doesn't die. Uh, I thought that was kind of funny because <laughs> there's an adult witnessing it, but then Ida doesn't get in trouble. And then he makes a car swerve into Hit her. her. Yeah, like looking back, there is a lot of that going on in this film, but then it just didn't, I don't know, it just feels like some badass kids who have these powers. And they're using them in a way that doesn't necessarily make sense to me. Like, I don't want to... Like, if Ben really wanted to hurt these people, he could have. Mm -hmm. Like, he could have killed Ida and Anna if he wanted to. On, se on many occasions. So, I'm confused like. why he doesn't. And then he gets done up so easily. And, yeah, I would, I would love to know what other people think about how the autistic character is used. How, um, like, race plays a part in the story. I just ended the film feeling uncomfortable and unsatisfied. And unsatisfied, yeah. But it is provocative. It, it Well, anytime you're dealing with murderous children, I feel, you know, of course, that's taboo and provocative. What else you got? That's, well, the shard of glass that she puts her sister's shoe Oh, another really uncomfortable scene. when we, But before we realize that there are any sort of superpowers, uh, Ida, being the little badass girl she is, she keeps trying to determine, like, if her sister... She inflicts pain on her autistic sister to see if she'll react verbally or in any way, and she doesn't. And then at a point, she puts broken glass in her poor sister's shoe, and that poor girl's walking around all day, and mm -hmm. she's clearly in pain, but she can't communicate it. That was really hard to watch. That was hard to and watch. And it's also that scene where we see that, is it Aisha who has a bloody foot? Yeah, like so she thinks she does, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah, it, to me, my note on that was like, she's going to that a little girl like that might turn into the Isabella Uper character in the piano teacher. Ugh. What would you give it? Two and a half. I would give it two and a half as well. Listen to our podcast. Bye.